Well, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Symposium 16, ET or be eating, don't miss out of interaction data at the TEDWI 2021 virtual conference. I'm Jose Augusto Salim and I will be the moderator. Martin Treckles, you co-moderate this session. Uh, we are grateful for the tech support from the University of Florida conference team. And before we get started, I want to remind everyone that the session is being recorded for later viewing. And I would like to ask the speakers to please speak slowly, clear, since you have a very diverse audience, okay? Attendees, please post your questions in the UVA app. This will be asked of the presenters by Martin, the cool moderator. The questions that don't get answered uh, during the session can be answered later. And uh, I would like to ask everybody, please follow the conference code of conduct. So thank you all for joining us. And each presenter you present for 10 minutes, then you'll be three minutes for questions and the end of each uh, presentation. The chat function has been made uh, available for technical questions and converse between the attendees. And uh, just, where is my, sorry, I lost my, oh, here. I sorry, I lost my, my screen. So let's, let's start it. Uh, our first speaker today is Pedro Giordano. Pedro is a professor of the Donana Biological Station at the University of Sevilla. His talk is titled The Biodiversity of Ecological Interactions, Challenges for Recording and Document the Life of Web. Please, Pedro, the, the floor is yours. Or better, the screen is yours, right? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jose Augusto. Welcome everyone and thank you very much. Uh, Jose and Martin for setting up this nice symposium focusing on biological interactions and also, of course, to the University of Florida for supporting this Congress that is being excellently managed. And it's a real pleasure also and an honor to be here and also meet Rafael uh, and Philip. So thank you very much. I'm sharing my screen. Is it okay? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so, well, uh, biodiversity is uh, the focus of our, uh, our research effort, and, and we all agree that there is an urgent need for its efficient and robust inventory, given the fast paces, loss of species that we are witnessing over the globe. We are losing species, species become extinct, yet an often missed component of biodiversity is the focus of my talk today, biological interactions. And those interactions among species, among individuals of different species are the wireframe of biodiversity. They support the web of life. And no single species on earth lives without interacting with other species. So this wireframe, uh, cataloging it, understanding this structure, the topology, it uh, means a lot for conservation efforts, for biodiversity conservation efforts. So my goal today for you is to review some basic elements of ecological interactions that illustrate, somehow illustrate the challenge we have ahead in order to design proper ontologies for the documentation of interactions and the data man management of interactions. In this, uh, in this uh, very nice American naturalist paper by Margalef in 1983, he, uh, he together with Emilia Gutierrez built a very nice analogy, an interesting analogy between biological diversity and the diversity of component parts in human-made artifacts that function. For instance, a fridge, a TV set, a logic board of a computer, a clock, any, any human-made artifact that function. And 
their main point was an interesting one for our efforts and our emphasis on interactions. It is that if we, if we want to understand the functioning of a complex artifact like those, we need more than the inventory of the 270 pieces of 38 different types. And we need more than this inventory in, in, in relation to the understanding of the functioning. We need more than that, we need also the rules that govern the connections among the pieces. If we, uh, if we have just the inventory and we assemble the pieces all at random, it is uh, almost unlikely, completely unlikely that we can get um, a functional uh, artifact. So the analogy is quite powerful in connection to the importance of interactions in ecosystem. And as Professor Jensen said, the loss extinction of interactions is a much more insidious kind of extinction than the extinction of a species. And that is because it often precedes it, precedes extinction, the loss of interactions occurs well before the species are, are lost. Um, and that means we are losing ecological functionality. We are losing the ecological functions that are the outcome of those interactions well before the species are extinct. So this extinction of interactions is often quite often very cryptic. Therefore, it is very urgent for us that we incorporate the documentation and the description of ecological interactions within mainstream biodiversity data science. And that is missing. We are, we are lacking good strategies for completing the biodiversity inventories with inventories of the biodiversity of interactions. There are myriads of different types of ecological interactions in nature, always involving more than species interactions. They involve what we actually record in the field are encounters between, between individual, for instance, here a Jacutinga eating in an individual uh, Palmito Jusara palm in southeastern Brazil. So we record encounters of individual partners and those encounters have outcomes that can be positive, negative or null between the involved partners. But they are extremely important, those outcomes of interactions to understand the function of interactions. The diversity, this enormous diversity of interaction means, means also that there are multiple types of data sources according to the appropriate method used to record interactions in the field. So recently, together with Elena Quintero and Jorge Isla, we have reviewed uh, different met methods for um, data merging strategies for the specific example of interactions between animal frugivores and fleshy fruited plants, the plants that they disperse, the seed that they disperse. And uh, we review the different methods and also propose convenient ways to merge the different type of data that come, for instance, from uh, direct census, censuses in nature, spot censuses or focal censuses, camera traps, mist netting, DNA barcoding, track, scenes, fecal analysis, iso stable isotopic analysis, and so on. You can imagine the challenges that, challenges that we have when trying to mix to merge those different type of data. That's a very important challenge we, are, we, we have ahead. But then otherwise, the fascinating thing is that sampling interactions is exactly the same as how we routinely sample biodiversity. Sampling interactions is exactly analogous to sampling species diversity. When we inventory biodiversity, our usual target is in Professor Daniel Jansen's words, a latent binomial. We are inventory, we are sampling individuals and we are targeting the, the positive taxonomic identification of individuals of different organisms, a latent binomial. So when we are sampling interactions, we are looking for those Latin tetranomials that Professor Jansen talks about. So here, the European robin, Eritacus rubecula, feeding on fruits of the lentisk, Pistacia lentiscus. We are seeking those latent tetranomials. 
the record, this latent tetranomial is the record of an interaction between an individual, for instance, an individual plant and an individual pollinator or an individual frugivore, like here in this, in this photo. So we proceed exactly as when we inventory a collection of specimens with its associated sampling effort. Here we have the cumulative number of pairwise interactions that we can detect between three animal species here and three plant species here in six consecutive days of sampling. So we start by sampling two distinct interactions, two between uh, animal species one and plant species A, two interactions, one here and another here, and then a distinct interaction that is one and B. So we are det detecting in the first day of sampling two distinct interactions, but three interactions in total between, uh, two, uh, between three species, okay? So we proceed, we continue our sampling effort, and finally, we have the whole set of interactions re recorded. That is exactly analogous to how we proceed when sampling, when sampling a species. But what are we actually sampling? And what would be the type of descriptors and the type of vocabulary ontologies that we absolutely need to characterize with sufficient biological reality all those interactions? We would be the best descriptor, the most efficient ontology to describe and document them within, for example, the Darwin Core framework or the TED web uh, standards. This is uh, year two the left. Is a complete sorry. Here to the left is a complete uh, is, is an is an interaction web uh, between plant species, the nodes here, and animal species, the nodes here, and we we can document the present absence of interactions are those links, but but then beneath those links we have actually a reciprocal. Uh, dependence of interactions between uh, here are fleshy fruited plant species and the animal frugivores that consume them. Those, uh, the reciprocity of those interactions can be symmetric, can be asymmetric, can be a, a null, can be a, very strong, not so many, not so much strong. We need those, those descriptors for, for those interactions. So this is what happens when two mm, two uh, individuals interacting in nature. For instance, here are frugivorous animals and are fleshy fruited plants. We have an encounter stage of the interaction occurring at the plant. And then at the plant, we have the interaction itself where we can record, for instance, the ingestion of a, of a fruit, the swallowing of the fruit. And that has immediate outcomes of the interactions. And then we have delayed outcomes. So encounter is a basic ecological record and we may have qualitative binary descriptors for it. It occurs, it doesn't occur or quantitative descriptors of it. The frequency of encounter, the visitation, occupation and so on. The delayed outcomes are much more difficult to record. At least in a direct, sample, direct sampling of interactions and yet they are very important because they told uh, us uh, uh, about is a very good information about the potential uh, functional effects of the interactions. For, for instance, what is the type of microhabitat where the seeds are deposited, uh, whether a pollination event occurs in uh, as an outcrossing event or not, and so on. So the type of vocabulary that we need has shared properties with the, bio, with the routine biodiversity inventory, the, the routine vocabularies. We need the partners IDs, uh, hopefully also with uh, different phenotypic traits of the plants and animals in this example of free living interactions among free living species. And then other traits such as the distribution area all the timing of the interaction, the phenology, and of course, all the metadata of the uh, associated to the interaction where, where it is an interaction record from a bi bibliographic source and, and so on. But then we need descriptors, proper descriptors of the encounter that typically 
refer to the presence or absence of the encounter or can be weighted. They, they can uh, relate to the frequency of encounter or uh, some categorical estimates of the relative importance of encounter. And then we have two sets of descriptor, the immediate outcome of the interactions, for instance, wh whether or not a pollinating, a pollinating insect is touching the stigma of the flower, whether a frugivore is swallowing the fruit whole and dispersing the seed away from the parent plant, or uh, any indica indicators of the delay that comes. And again, those could be binary, those could be weighted, those could be meristic um, we, or categorical or other type. So a basic ecological interaction, interaction record may take the form of a series of descriptors referring to these basic interaction components. The first is the partner organism IDs and not just the IDs, also traits like body mass, seed size, phenology, timing, and so on. You can imagine how many we can, we can get. Second, the presence and frequency of encounter. That's related to the ecological, the ecological concept of probability of interspecific encounter. And this, it is very important. That can be the number of visits, number of records per 10 hours during focal watches, or camera trap monitoring and so on. And the per interaction effect that has to deal with the, what happens in the actual interaction here in, uh, in the actual encounter. We are just starting to design these components within the Darwin core framework with great advances for plant pollinator interactions. And then slowly we are advancing more and more and hopefully we, we will have uh, more and more descriptors of the interactions and those can be highly complex as you can imagine. So now we, are, we have just launched here in Southern Spain, a large project, the LifeWatch project is an Eric, a large project to catalog ecological, all the types of ecological interactions in Southern Spain with a great effort in sampling and compiling ecological interactions. So uh, we have a, uh, uh, really a lot of work ahead given the extreme diversity of interaction context that we may have and the interaction types that uh, we may have. And then mm, uh, we are also considering the ecological interactions more broadly uh, in all the world to properly, de properly define a bi biological and meaning meaningful, meaningful conceptual backbone to develop efficient ontologies. Our strategy is based on identifying not just the outstanding diversity of ecological interaction context, there are not many, the outcomes that are mostly positive or negative interactions, and then the functions that basically, especially for a, a free living species like the, uh, those illustrated here are movement, protection and nutrient extraction and then cataloging all uh, the interaction types. And we, ha we, we have almost 60 different types of interactions so far. And then in terms of the, the ontologies to characterize the immediate and the layer that comes of interactions, we are developing uh, descriptors quite similar to those that are you developing in Revit or those that are used in Globi uh, to, to try to be as specific as we can in trying to document the outcome of interactions. And that can be quite specific, but then really a challenge is to find the common ground that is shared by all type, any type of interaction that will be basically the rate of encounter, the probability of encounter, and then documenting what comes after that encounter uh, takes place. And that, uh, that is a real challenge that, that and let me stress how Jurgen, uh, this cataloging effort is given the fast pace of extinction, not just of a species, but also their interactions, as I commented before. What we are uh, facing is the inventory of what I call biodiversity's interacton. That is a total number of ecological interactions among component, the end component species that we may record in a given ecosystem. 
that would be the total interaction. The challenges that we have in, in ecology and conservation biology are exactly analogous to the study of other, other complex systems like the brain, the gene regulatory networks, the cell me metabolic networks with all the protein-protein interactions and so on. So the number of interactions that need to be recorded and experimentally proved in those systems increases supra exponentially with the number of component species. In our case, this is called in complex system theory, Bell's number. So if we have just three components, there are five way, ways to connect them. And this number of connections is triply increases, increasing the number of species. This is the 52 ways that just five components can be connected. And there are, there are more than 100,000 ways to connect uh, 10 species, okay? So uh, this is uh, what some uh, researchers like Koch, for instance, in this nice paper in science in 2015 called the complexity break. We don't have neither time to sample those interactions to resolve those highly complex network. We don't have the computing power, the uh, CPU time required to solve all those uh, interactions in those complex network. So it is very urgent that we need, that, that we compile not only the cataloging, but also our understanding of how complex work, uh, complex network of interactions work in, in nature. I'll finish here just emphasizing that ecological interactions are a fundamental part of biodiversity that has been rarely considered in uh, efforts to inventory and catalog biodiversity. And we need to expand the concepts of biodiversity loss to include also the loss of biotic interactions with has uh, associated crucial ecological functions. Hopefully the Darwin core framework and TEDWEC standards can properly accommodate these efforts and provide proper tools to develop biologically sound descriptors and ontologies for ecological interactions. Um, thank you again, Jose Augusto and Martin for inviting me to this symposium. It's a, a great pleasure. And thank you to the organizers of, of the Congress and of course, to the people labs and thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. It's very interesting to, to hear from you as always. Uh, we don't have time for questions right now. So I will let the questions for the end of the session because you have some time to left there, okay? Perfect. So Thank you. let's move for our next uh, speaker. Uh, Philip Butterwill, he's a postdoc researcher at Ecology Department of Czech Academy of Science, and his presentation will be titled Life Webs, a Global Database of Bart Be Part of the Ecological Interaction Network. Please, Phil. Okay, thank you, uh, Jose. Thank you for inviting us to present at this uh, symposium. Um, my name is Phil Buckterell. I'm based at the Czech Academy of Sciences in the Czech Republic, as are my co-authors. And I'd like to talk about um, the LifeWebs project, um, what it is, and how it might contribute to a standardized framework or, uh, for ecological interaction data uh, in the future. So in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen a real boom in the popularity and importance of network ecology. So this project was conceived by Tom Fail as a way to examine and answer certain ecological questions, such as how does the structure of these interaction networks change in response to, for example, latitude or elevation uh, and things like human disturbance or, or land use change. So we focus on bipartite interaction, interaction types. Uh, that is those interactions between two discrete levels or groups of organisms. Um, you can often see represented in this kind of diagrammatic form in the literature. So one level would be one group of organisms, in this case plants, 
and another level would be the other uh, group of organisms, in this case, herbivores. Um, we are focused on plant herbivore interactions in our group, so we started there, but now we're expanding into other interaction types, such as host parasitoid, plant pollinator, predator prey, uh, among others. Um, so this project is essentially a, a meta-analysis project. And so we needed to compile a database of networks to analyze um, with the attention of um, when the project is over, this becoming a, a public resource. Um, so that's the LifeWebs database. Um, we also have a, a website if anyone wants to check that out. So a valid question may be, do we really need another network database? Because after all, we already have um, several open online databases um, already, um, all excellent in their own way. Uh, well, yes, we figured that we do, um, and for two main reasons. Uh, for one thing, for certain interaction types, we are adding lots of, of new data sets. So currently there are not that many, uh, for example, plant herbivore networks or host parasitide networks available. We are actually adding quite a lot of new data sets for these uh, interaction types in particular. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is that we wanted to obtain a much richer set of metadata uh, about the studies that we could uh, use in uh, analyses, um, especially concerning information about sampling methods, uh, sampling protocols, and things like uh, sampling effort that could be used in analyses as a, as a control or a weighting. Um, other things we wanted to include were anthropogenic factors, uh, human pressures, and we also wanted to augment the data with um, certain environmental data, uh, such as temperature and precipitation. And finally, um, allow for the inclusion of uh, species traits. So this is basically how we went about uh, compiling the database. We started by doing um, searches for relevant articles, uh, publications on, on Web of Science and other platforms, and then reached out to the authors um, for, for if they wanted to be involved in the project. We provided an Excel template, which could be downloaded from our website, and then they could fill in the, the data and return it to us. And we split this template into four worksheets, one for a matrix or network, one for species, one for sampling effort, and the other for metadata. We also took networks from the already existing online databases that I mentioned before. And so once we had the data in, in LifeWebs, the next challenge was to extract it into a usable form for analysis. So we de devised a, a script uh, in Python to ex that extracted the data into flat CSV files, which could then be analyzed in R. And to that end, we are working on a, an R package to make access to the data um, easier. So one of the key challenges with this pipeline uh, was data validation. And obviously if you've got lots of people filling in uh, a form, in, especially in Excel, it can come out with very different results. Um, but rather than attempting to bolster Excel with, with validation, we decided to add functionality to our script that extracts the data. So this Python script is actually doing quite a lot of work um, it checks species codes that they match in the different worksheets. Uh, it's checking date fields that they are in the right format. Um, we average out geo coordinates and elevation if multiple values are given. Um, 
We are attempting species cleaning, especially for morpha species, which can come in all, all sorts of uh, um, messy ways. And also attempting to link those species to online taxonomic resources such as ITIS or GBIF. And we're also using the data science toolkit, um, which has an API uh, from which we can also check geo coordinates and elevation, locality, and we can download environmental data for those based on those coordinates and habitat information. So what we actually end up with is a set of uh, data and metadata that at all levels of the hierarchy from individual interactions to networks of interactions to data sets of networks, which provides fairly decent challenge for standardization. Then we became involved in the world of Tedwig and Darwin Core uh, through Jose, our session moderator, and we started to think about how to represent this kind of interaction data in a, in a standardized way. And so this is one sort of simplified idea of how, what sort of shape this might take. Uh, this is really based on Jose's work with the, um, the Interaction Data Interest Group. I am by no means an expert on uh, Darwin Core, but taking this um, simple individual interaction between a leaf miner eating a plant, uh, we would have um, two occurrences for the organisms. Uh, which would then be linked by this resource relationship, which would contain the details of the interaction. And, and maybe that would be uh, using a controlled vocabulary, such as the relation ontology, um, in which these kind of terms, eats, is eaten by, uh, parasitizes, is parata parasitized by, uh, exists. So that, I think that could be a really useful uh, addition. The occurrences could also be linked to an event. And coming from a, a database background, as I do, it makes sense that this is a hierarchical, hierarchical relationship with, um, with parent events that could apply to the network and to the data set level. And therefore, we could uh, have uh, metadata at all levels of the hierarchy. Um, I'm not sure exactly how this works in practice, but that is, um, I think, uh, one uh, start. So finally, um, just a few thoughts. Uh, in terms of the LifeWebs project, uh, we really need to work on um, mapping our terms to Darwin core terms or other extensions in TEDWIG. Uh, because one of the main problems or challenges in this project um, is clarif clarifying terms, uh, especially around sampling, uh, sample effort, um, sample unit. These terms have evolved over time and are quite confusing in the literature, and they mean different things to different people. So I think this really needs focusing on. And other things um, requiring uh, special attention are that the direction of the interaction, uh, whether it's reciprocal. Um, uh, also, can, how can we record um, evidence of the interaction um, and uncertainty? Um, is, the is the interaction based on um, direct observation or is it uh, sort of secondary evidence like a, a call, a bird call or something? And finally, we should also think beyond bipartite um, interactions to k-partite interactions, for example, uh, tritrophic networks, where you have, for example, plants, herbivores, and then parasitoids. And how do we deal with those? So that's it from me. I'd just like to acknowledge all the many people who've helped uh, work on this project. And um, again, thanks to Jose for inviting us to the uh, symposium. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh,
we have time for one uh, question. So uh, Katja Seltman says, uh, send the question in the Q&A. Does the live web project add additional information that is not in the publication or from the authors? For example, do you record environmental conditions only if it's recorded in a paper or do you infer from other data sources? Uh, well, in that particular example, we, uh, with the environmental information, no, it's, it's coming from the API, the data science toolkit. So we, we of course, rely on getting the geo coordinates from the authors and based on those coordinates, we can get the relevant climate information and, and other information on, on habitat, the typical habitat for that sort of area. So that particular example is not is not based on the authors uh, what the authors have given us. Yes, thank you again, Phil. Uh, no so let's move on. Our next speaker is Rafael Pinheiro. He's also a postdoc at the University of Campinas. And his presentation is uh, you'll be titled Classification of Biotic Interactions Challenge in the Field and in the Analysis. Please, Rafael. Are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Oh, okay. So thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here with you. And uh, today I decided to talk a bit about some of the main challenges for, uh, for any kind of standardization of species interaction data. So today I'm going to talk about the problem, but I'm not pretending I have a solution for this problem, uh, but I think it's something that must be taken into account. Uh, so classifying interactions is something difficult. When we look to the interaction categories in databases, we begin to see where this difficulty, where these challenges arrive. So when we go to the web of life, one of the most used uh, in, uh, interaction database, we have these categories, plant herbivore, host parasitoid and seed dispersal, plant ant. It's not very different from the interaction web database with just some small difference, like food web is predator prey in interaction web database, seed dispersal is plant seed dispersal. And anyway, so let's have a, a closer look at these categories. How are these categories defined? Some of them are trophic interactions. So some of them is the description of an animal eating a plant or another animal, or at least it's partially tropical, such as uh, seed dispersal and pollination. Uh, some are taxon specific, such as plant ant, anemone fish, uh, host parasitoid is at least partially taxon specific because par parasitoids is taxonomically defined. But most important, as ecologists, we are most interested in the function of the interaction. So interactions categories are mostly functional. They describe some, somehow the function of what is happening there, the nature of what is happening, because this is what we ecologists are most interested in. Uh, and even the ones which are not explicitly functional, it's implicitly functional. Because if I see a fish eating an anemone, probably I won't include it as a anemone fish interaction in this database. I would include it as a food web. So I'm implicitly uh, defining the function of this interaction. And some even, and in this case is host parasite, I think most of them, uh, requires some knowledge of the interaction sign. After all, to define a parasite is to say that this organism is causing harm to the host. Otherwise, it's not a parasite. The main challenge here is that functional interactions are processes, not events. I mean, 
Professor Jordano told, uh, explained that very well in his presentation. Uh, and I'm going to use the same example, a classical uh, interaction category, which is seed dispersal. So seed dispersal is a process. It's something that happens in many steps. So we have the frugivory. This is a, a typical seed dispersal interaction. So a, a bird eats the fruits of some plant, and then it, it ingests the seeds, and it transport the seed from place to another, and then it deposits the seed in a specific site. Uh, so it's a process, but we observe events, not processes. So our observation are almost never the entire process. We can't see all the steps. We have a given observation. This observation is what we include in the database. So this is the, in my opinion, this is the main challenge for data standardization of species interaction. Um, so for instance, in seed dispersal, the most common is that we see the frugivory. We see the animal eating a given fruit and we don't see the other. Of course, now there is, uh, a lot of works with uh, DNA barcoding on feces of birds and bats. But anyway, we are just seeing one step in this process. We are not seeing the entire process. Uh, and then if I see that I, I bird ate some fruit, I can even, I can question where the seeds ingested, where the seeds destroyed during the ingestion. We don't know. Have the seed survived during good passage? We don't know. Is the site suitable? Were the seeds deposited in a suitable place for um, germination? We don't know. And if any of these steps, any one of these steps uh, were not fulfilled, the interaction as a functional interaction had not occurred. Not at least not as we expected it to occur. Um, so this is the, in my opinion, the main uh, challenge, and it's related to the next challenge that is in most cases we cannot know interaction sign. We cannot know the fitness output of the interaction. So traditionally, when we see these categories, we say. Uh, these are mutualistic, seed dispersal, pollination, plant, ant, anemone, fish, and these are antagonistic interactions. But let's get back to seed dispersal. So again, in our exemplified interaction here, we never know because we often uh, only see this first event here, whether the entire uh, process have taken place. But even if the process have taken place, even if this uh, resulted in the plant having some reproductive success, it is, this is not a proof that this is a mutualism because the mutualism depends on the, uh, on the outcome of the interaction in the sense that I would have to compare the reproductive success of the plant when the interaction occur to the reproductive success of the plant without the interaction, because many plants can uh, disperse its seeds without an animal. It's possible that the outcome does not compensate because in each step of this process, there are costs and there are benefits uh, related. And we, to classify some interaction as beneficial or or uh, detrimental, we would have to know the difference between the fitness without the interaction and the fitness with the interaction occurring. So the interaction sign is this, this different. What I mean here is that we infer the functional uh, nature of the interaction and the interaction sign by the events we observe. I'm not saying that this is bad. In the end, there is no other solution. We have to do this as ecologists, that's what we do. But I think this must be taken into account. 
when we want to standardize uh, the species interaction or biotic interaction uh, data. So we see events. We see a bird eating a fruit. We see a butterfly visiting a flower. Then from this, we infer the functional nature of the interaction. So each step has uh, a higher uncertainty. I can be sure that I see the, the bird uh, eating the fruit, but I can't be sure that this is a seed dispersal interaction. The event is clear. The functional classification of it is an inference that I can do with more or less uh, confidence, depending on what I have seen, what are the species that are interacting. And then from the functional classification, we infer again what is the interaction sign of the, the interaction we have seen. Uh, and ideally, any initiative for species interaction data standardization should take these challenges into account. So I, I think ideally, we should be able to separate what is the event observed from what is the inferences we made about this event. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael. Yeah, thank you. That was perfect timing. That was uh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> 10 minutes. So um, I don't see any questions uh, popping up. One remark from Pedro that, uh, that we about the recording events and outcomes, but the inferring of processes. Um, Pedro, do you want to comment further on this? It was just, just a comment. And I, I, I highlight that I totally agree with the uh, Raphael points. And, and it's uh, really those challenges that we, that we have. So to separate the recording of events from the recording of uh, outcomes and the interpretation of outcomes. Thank you, Rafael. Yeah, this this uh, something that we have discussed a lot in the interest group, right? What is the knowledge? What is uh, 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 primary data? What is what it can actually measure and observe? That's a very interest uh, discussion. Yeah. So, I, I, okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, I I mean uh, we. Uh, Everything depends on the questions we are uh, trying to answer with the data. So a data that is able to better separate what is being inferred to what is, is really observed uh, is more useful for many of these questions. Yeah, for sure. So we have a lot of work and a lot of discussions that is, that very, that is very exciting, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's move to the last presentation that you be mine. Are you let's share my screen. It's okay. Everyone can see. Yes, uh, but almost. It's loading. Not yet. Oh yes. Yeah. So uh, I will present uh, the plant pollinator vocabulary uh, contribution to interaction data standardization. So it's it's about uh, a project that we have worked uh, since uh, 2004. Uh, this when the the Brazilian network on plant pollinator interactions was founded at the first Brazilian pollination symposium. The goals, the main goals of the, the Brazilian network are to encourage the collaborative studies among participants, production of the diagnosis of plant pollinator interactions in Brazil, uh, integration knowledge and pollination of natural agriculture, urban and historic areas, identification of knowledge gaps and proposal of guidelines to support public policy uh, on conservation of biodiversity. So uh, some achievements of the Brazilian network, uh, we had uh, four workshops where we, we 
we started to develop the, the data standards for quantum nature interactions. And so it's what I'm talking here today. Uh, we also have a, a, a thematic report on pollination, pollination, and food production in the platform of uh, ecosystem service. Uh, the organization of uh, international pollination course, two, two, two courses in 2017, 2019. Integration of other networks like in the Latin American countries like Chilean Pollination Network and equivalent groups in Argentina, and uh, participation in public policy uh, for conservation of pollinators in Brazil, and uh, develop a pollinator interactions database. So here, just uh, to have a picture of how people are documenting interactions using the Argent Core, actually we have many possibilities. Uh, you can use uh, associated taxa, associated occurrence, resource relationship, occurrence remarks, dynamic properties, or measure fact. And uh, there are many other uh, terms that can use for, for free textual description of interactions. So with a quick uh, review of the Darwin Core archives, uh, more than uh, 56,000 uh, uh, data sets, we saw that uh, the most used term for recording a species interaction is associated taxa. And then we have occurrence remark that is very interest, then associated occurrence and research relationships is very, very underused. And then we have a dynamic properties and reference. So as uh, I already told that there are many different vocabulary expressions and, uh, uh, and words to, to, to represent interaction types. And when we look to the data sets, we see there are much more, more of them. So here are just some examples of, uh, I put here interaction types and, uh, and in commas because uh, they are not actually interactions. Some of them are just, uh, uh, labels that's not related to direct like semi s or uh, core occurring or in some way. But however, as we know, there are some ontologies, especially relation ontology that can be used to standardize these direction types. There are many different here, just one example of the terms that can be used to represent the interactions. So uh, what were, were the challenges that we had uh, and we still have to, 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 to endure this project is uh, the Darwin core associated tax and associated occurrence, despite being simple, they do not capture all information about interactions. We have heard it from Pedro and Fire and Phil that the, there are many other ecological attributes that, are, that, are, that matter like the traits, the, the distribution, the environment, it's very important to, 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 re, to, to look uh, and analyze those uh, interaction data. So we also have a lack of vocabularies and data models to document interaction in its full extent. Uh, although, and uh, although powerful, the resource relationship and measure fat class are underused, maybe it's too complicated to the general public. So how we can make it less scary? How can uh, make people starting to use research relationship and measure fact. Uh, and how we can extend the star schema of Darwin Core Archives, maybe it's no flake schema, but just some questions. So uh, the current approach, like uh, this, when we use the associated taxa, we actually link our occurrence with a taxa name. So it's occurrence linked to a name. We don't know anything more than a name, uh, of uh, interacting species. So uh, here, just uh, some example, we have uh, our occurrence and we know that the host of the, that occurrence in Manihati is Kulenta. When do we use the associated occurrence, we are linked one occurrence to, to a list of occurrence, one or, or, or multiple occurrence. And again, we can also have a label and uh, that represents our interaction type plus ID that's identified that the occurrence is being tracked. So it's, it's, it's richer than the associated taxa, 
but there are the same uh, uh, problems that we can represent more than, uh, than that. We need more information about the interactions themselves. When you use the resource relationship, actually we're doing the same. We're associated one occurrence to another, but now we have more, we have a set of terms that we can use to uh, characterize and to document the, the interactions. Uh, of course, there are some other ways like the dynamic properties and the measure effect. So here's some just examples. So uh, in, they are uh, handled, but maybe they're a little bit difficult to, to, to work with compared to relational issues. It's something that we have to figure out. We don't know how community responded to that. So what we did in the plant coordinator vocabulary and in the uh, Brazilian network uh, project, we used the mix of uh, resource relationship with measure effect to represent the interactions. So the plant coordinator uh, interaction vocabulary uh, includes terms uh, to document interacts beyond taxonomic, spatial, and temporal aspects. And the way that we include four terms in five categories. Uh, terms for the plant, like a flower abundancy, and uh, terms for the animal, like the case of the of the bee or something like that. Uh, terms for specific for the flowers, so we can specify the flower colors, uh, the number of uh, of uh, pollen grains per year, something like something like that. Then you have uh, specific terms for the interactions, like the resource that collected, what the, the animal collected from the, from the flower. Then you have uh, uh, terms for to measure, uh, to, to document the reproductive success of the plant, and also for nectar dynamics. So here, just in color, some just some examples. Uh, the, cur the current verse of uh, plant pollinator vocabulary is uh, publicly available at this link here. I will post it in the chat so people can uh, see that. Uh, and how we did to, to, to represent interactions using Darwin Core Archives. So we use uh, the extended measure of fact from the uh, Ocean Observation Information System and you employ that plant pollinator interaction vocabulary as a controlled vocabulary to this specific term, measurement type ID. And we use the Darwin Core event class to represent our interactions, or in, in other words, something that some action that occurs in some location during some time. Uh, we also use the resource relationship as to document the type and the direction of interaction between two occurrences can be more than, than two, but we are talking about more to prioritize interactions. And we employ the relation ontology as a controlled vocabulary for the new Darwin core term, resource, uh, uh, relationship of resource ID. So this is a simplified view of the model. So we have uh, an event that represents an interaction and link it to this core event to have two occurrences here. And those occurrences are also linked to a uh, resource relationship. So here we can describe many characteristics of the interaction using, oh, sorry, using uh, extended measure facts. So we can link measurements to the interaction and we can also link it measurements to the occurrence themselves. So in that way, we could uh, explore and extend the, the star schema. It's the, actually the same, same way that uh, they did the ocean uh, biodiversity information system. Uh, to simplify uh, data input for people in the Brazilian network, we elaborate a spreadsheet. And these spreadsheets have some options in, as a control of vocabularies for, the, for, for, for many fields. And uh, after this, this template spreadsheet is, is filled, 
people submit it for, uh, for uh, plant pollinator database. And there we transform that spreadsheet in a Darwin core card to share uh, uh, with another uh, institutions. So here just a, a picture of the plant pollinator interactions database. This is still in development. So here we have a list of interactions for these two uh, taxon here. And uh, we, we plan to, to extend that together so people can make a, a advanced search and can download the uh, interactions in many different formats. So I would like to acknowledge Paula, Professor Antonio Saraiva, Deborah, Felipe and John for discussing and help the, during the development of this work. Also all the members of the Brazilian network and the Tedwick Biologic Species Interaction Data and also the St. Paul Research Foundation for founding this, this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. I don't see any immediate questions rising in the Q&A. I see that Jorit had some comments in the chat on the resource relationship. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, yeah, let me see. You mean in the Zoom chat? In the, in the, uh, the Wuva chat. Uh, oh, so, okay, yeah. Could you verbally speak, Jorit, please? Present your... Yeah, I will try. Sometimes I have uh, troubles um, uh, making a sentence. But um, so the resource relationships, uh, the way of sort of documenting species interactions has been, uh, has seen more use uh, recently. So I noticed that some of the numbers that you shared were, I think, in the order of 5,000, right? That there were 5,000 yeah. species interaction records. So I'd be curious to see how that increased adoption is reflected in those numbers. When did you do those? Um, when did you sample all of GBEF? Yeah, it was, uh, I think, uh, some five months ago when we did uh, some, some work of Preston, I think. Uh, uh -huh. It was before the... the, the the last version of Darwin Core, right? They have a very uh, uh, precise recommendations of the use of resource relationship, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the new yeah, term, it, resource relationship mm -hmm. ID. Yeah, it'd be neat to see, uh, to uh, repeat what we did there or what you did there and see how the, how the adoption is uh, changing the numbers. Yeah, this would be great, right? Yeah, and we, we should be able to do it. So. Yeah. It's, I, I have a question Thank you. for all of the presenters. Uh, we, 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 we are looking for a standard, right? For, for uh, or standardization of the interaction data, but uh, we're still looking for a spreadsheet. We are, we, we are inputting spreadsheet, right? In the Rebipe uh, database, the people give us a spreadsheet as input. Phil also talked about the, uh, the, the input, uh, the template spreadsheet that people are using. So how we can move from that to, to, to research relationship, this uh, relational model, one to many, and how can, uh, train people maybe for that. I don't know. Is there anyone brave enough to uh, <laughs> that uh, question? Uh, one, one possible way could be uh, to have a simplified scheme so uh, so that people can be more confident in, in providing some basic information about the interaction. So, so in, my, 
in my view that I, I, I made an effort in, in translated in my talk is, is that there are some, some basic components of interactions that are everywhere. And those are the identities of the partners and then how frequently they encounter each other. And then if, if uh, contributors have some type of uh, scheme in the, in the spreadsheet so that, so that they can overlay more and more data uh, so that they can increase the complexity of their contribution, their specific contributions, that could be a way. Because otherwise, uh, the, the problem would be that uh, we'll have lots of, 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 of uh, missing data about, uh, about the specific interactions because the, the particulars of the details of the traits involved, for instance, or the outcomes, they, they are highly specific for, for different uh, interaction contexts, and those would be very difficult to categorize. Yeah, they are very diverse, right? Maybe we should be interacting more with uh, people from traits, uh, standardization, with, because this is something that is, we can import it for them and then reuse, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and also my, my, my feeling is that, and, and I'm not an expert in, the, in, the, in, in data science management or, or the Darwin core, but my, my gut feeling when I read and study the, the documentation is that we are still missing some basic, basic ontologies for, for interactions so, so that we can we can get easier having those identifying this common ground for interaction for for interactions. For instance, Jose Augusto, you you did a very nice work implementing the vocabulary regarding resource relationship or or relationships of resources ID. But there are many ecological interactions that are not resource based, so we may have a gap there in the ontology of the descriptors, I mean, in, in the descriptor. So maybe we, we, we need to find a new descriptor for some particular types of interactions. For instance, uh, protection interactions. It is very, sometimes it's difficult to identify the resource, the type of resource that is traded in, an, in a uh, protection interaction, okay? Thank you. Just, just to make clear, I just put the piece together. Uh, the terms and the, and the, and the vocabulary is a community driven. And uh, Jory, too, I think it was the, uh, who proposed the, the new resource re relationship ID. So I just put the piece together. And thank you for help of all. The... We have. Um... Oh, can... One more question from Katya, uh, just to see for the Rebu project, do you have that spreadsheet available somewhere online or uh, is it something internally used for the project? Actually, this is internal because we are looking for to populate the Brazilian database, but I don't see any problem to, to make it public so people can reuse that. We did not do that yet, because we already developed the database, so we maybe we can change the, 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 the template, but I don't see any problem to, to share that. So Jose, Jose you might you might um, say something about the next step. So we, we are previewing to have those that spreadsheet available in the public review process so you must say something about that yeah we actually were looking for to create a task group on plant pollinator interactions and uh, put all this data model and the vocabulary and the spreadsheet in the community review international community review so we can have more insights and inputs about the, the applicability and the, of, this, of this scheme and this, this, this proposal. Uh, for us now here in Brazil, this have uh, worked 
very nice. We are doing, uh, I think, for four or three projects uh, of uh, digitalization and standardization of uh, plant pollinator interactions. And uh, when we're done, we, we, we actually we will be able to see uh, how far we, we can go with this, this model. So does anybody has any comments or questions? I will open for everyone. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was just wondering whether um, we could find a way to review each other's data in a, in a sort of a periodic way, because it sounds like we have all our different ways to express what it is we understand uh, is happening out there and how to capture that this extremely valuable data and through all the integration work that I'm doing through uh, Globi, I see all these data sets coming in. I see commonalities, I see differences. And um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things really out of that is that I can ask questions, very specific questions. For instance, when, if, I, if I'm able to index Pedro's data sets, I can ask, oh, why did you use this term and not that term? Or can I interpret this as that, right? So to me, these very specific questions are the, are the foundation, could be the foundation for a more standardized way of working, sort of a shared understanding of what we can do together and what we can't do together. Because you know some things are just very specific. So for instance, frequency of, of occurrence makes sense maybe for plant pollinators, but for the fish diet folks, they think about it in terms of percent of stomach volume, which is like, what's that, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd be curious to hear your, your thoughts on this, uh, Pedro and Phil and Rafael. Yes, uh, thank you, Jory. Just my uh, quick response, uh, almost brainstorming <laughs> now with that. I, I totally agree. So, so I think that the, the main issue is not getting lost in the, in the details, not getting lost in the, in, the amazing, in the amazing details of the natural history of the interactions and then um, seeking uh, a descriptor for each particular detail that we, that we find. So to me, uh, I think that a, a major challenge is to, to have a, a solid, a robust, a common ground on top of which we can develop more and more detail, accommodating all the different types, the, the, the zillions of different types of interactions that we encounter. So my, in my vision, we, we are still far from having that common ground that makes us comfortable building on top of that. So we, we need more effort rather than trying to accommodate particular interactions in the scheme, developing that common ground where those interactions can enter and then build like overlays of complexity in the description, in the ontologies of those, so, so that more details of the interactions can be accommodated. But again, I'm just thinking aloud. So. Yeah, I agree with you. Please, yeah. please. Antonio. Yeah, it's me, okay. Thank you, Pedro. I think you're right. Uh, I would just like to add that um, we're talking from a point different from uh, the one that people started uh, many years ago with Darwin Core. So we're starting from a point where the digitization has gone forward uh, for uh, occurrences. So we have one or two billion records in, in GBIF, for instance. Um, 
And uh, we must remember that Darwin Quar also only became a standard long after it, it started. So my point is, we need to start working on that. Start, of course, people are already doing that, already digitizing. And I'm just uh, wondering that we, we should have more uh, hands-on activities, trying to implement those things and trying to uh, build those databases and discussing uh, what are we, uh, at which point are we coming with that? Because I, I'm afraid that uh, there's so many uh, questions, e either from um, an ecological point of view, they're not, not everything is clear. There's some questions about how to define things. There are some questions about how to represent, uh, how to digitize more practical things. And we can't in, in no way uh, wait for all of that move much forward before we have something in, in place to start with. Because uh, uh, as, as time goes, people are still uh, continue to digitize data anyway, in any format, any representation. And maybe we can uh, have an approach in which we try to, to have something going on and try to discuss, of course, we can review that just as with Darwin Core. Darwin Core has been reviewed many times instead of uh, getting trapped in too many discussions before we have something uh, for the community uh, at large to, to try to use and, and, and discuss. That, that's my main concern. We have been discussing the idea of having uh, interactions within Tadwig has at least 10 or 15 years since we first uh, proposed uh, something on, on plant pollinators uh, interactions. That was, it was probably in 2006. Uh, now we were much more mature in terms of what we have been thinking about, uh, more, many more people discussing that, but I'm afraid we, we can't uh, wait too much to start to have something uh, implemented to show, even if it's to, to find out that this is not good to have to, 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 to change to something different. This is my main concern. And, and for that, it's good to have like we had almost 60 people here uh, interested. We have more to have more interactions, by the way, uh, amongst us to discuss and see how we can move forward. Yeah, thank you. you. Uh, okay, sorry, Martin. No, 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 go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, we have time for just one question. I think Katya want to say something. Um, thank you, and thank you for the um, organization of the symposium. You know, when I first started, um, I share biotic interactions and often about bees and plant uh, insect interactions uh, with global biotic interactions. And when I first started, um, I feel like I made a mistake. And that mistake was really trying to interpret the literature or interpret the interactions, um, uh, even at the event level uh, up front. And, um, and so now I moved into, especially with the literature interactions, um, making that interpretation, going ahead with it, but also capturing uh, the verbatim interaction information, which in the literature is actually how the author describes it. And, um, and that's been very freeing because it allows for changes in interpretation later, um, uh, which I think is what everybody's been talking about um, is that um, as we gain more evidence, the or our ontologies uh, become more granular and better defined, um, those interpretations and the language that we're using to talk about those interactions uh, will change through time. And so this is really a very challenging um, and exciting um, uh, uh, thing that we're embarking on is not only to create a standard is what I'm hearing, but a standard that has flexibility uh, inherent in the system to be able to make multiple interpretations uh, um, as uh, our thinking changes about the ecological interactions. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, I think it's, we have to, to separate our uh, own desiring knowledge and, and inference in the interaction when we are looking and reading them or yeah. observing them. It's very difficult when you're, actually you are looking and observe uh, behaviors 
uh, and uh, it's, it's tried very difficult to to separate the subject or part of the of the observations. Yeah, so, so a ver some kind of a ver verbatim field, which is what uh, I share now with global biotic interactions, is verbatim text um, in any kind of standard. I think would be uh, really a necessity. Yeah. So we have reached the end of session. We can continue the discussions in the UVA app in the chat, we can schedule meetups between the, the speakers and the attendees to, to, to continue the discussion. And uh, before we finish, uh, I would like to invite everyone to join us in the TEDWIG Biological Interactions Interest Group. Uh, I will put the link in the chat of Yuva app. And also I want to try and invite all the participants to the hands-on session that we have uh, after the conference. Uh, I think it should be November 10. So you'll find more details in the conference website. So thank you again, thank you everyone. And I look forward to see you all in the interest group and the hands-on session. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Jose. Thank you. thank you very much. Bye everyone. Thanks for organizing. It was my pleasure. Uh, mm -hmm.